It is now my great privilege to introduce our tonight's speaker, Dr. Ted Floyd. Ted is the editor of Breeding Magazine and an award-winning flagship publication that the American Breeding Association puts out. He has written over five blurred books and is the author for over 200 public popular articles, technical papers, uh, chapters on birds and nature, and much more. He was a graduate of Princeton University and Penn State University and has taught biology, math, statistics to everyone from second graders to advanced graduate students. Two years ago, Ted taught a two-day field course here at ACES, and I so much enjoyed our conversations around our shared love for birds, nature, writing, and passion for citizen science. So it is such an honor to welcome Ted to our 2020 Naturalist Night series. Take it away, Ted. Um, Phoebe, thank you very much for the nice introduction. It's wonderful to be here, whatever that means, with all of you all. Uh, and we're going to be talking, as you can see here, about community science in the age of hashtag social distancing. Um, that is to say, community science, studying birds, enjoying birds, studying nature and enjoying nature um, in this very strange and troubling time that we find ourselves in, the age of the COVID-19 pandemic. I hope to keep the proceedings fairly uh, lively and fun and, and upbeat and positive and I will get around to that in just a moment, but I do want to acknowledge before we get going, and I want to do so on sort of a, a, a serious and sort of somber note here, that there's nothing good, there's nothing fun, there's nothing really hopeful or promising about being alive in this age of the pandemic. As we all know, hundreds of thousands of Americans have died in it, and tens of millions of people's lives have been very grievously affected by it. And what's so frustrating and, and really sort of um, maddening to me is that so much of what is happening um, is due to human error. It all could have been prevented or at least substantially prevented. So we are alive during a difficult and troubling time. I don't want to sugarcoat that. I don't want to qualify or make apologies for it, but I do want to say it and then get underway with this evening's presentation, which I shall do now without any further ado. All righty. As Phoebe mentioned in her introduction of me, she and I share a passion for environmental education, for communicating broadly to folks out there about birds and nature. Our respective organizations, ACES and ABA, ABA stands for the American Birding Association, are both very much in the business of transmitting wonder and knowledge and ideally understanding and concern for birds and other wild things. So when Phoebe called me up, well, a few weeks ago, maybe it was a few months ago, actually, it's all become sort of a blur now, and suggested that I talk about studying birds, appreciating birds in nature during the pandemic. Uh, we had this sort of Vulcan mind meld where we came together almost instantly and thought that it would be a great idea to sort of review the sorts of things that bird watchers and other nature lovers can do in the digital era from their laptops, on their phones, uh, engaged with crowdsourced resources like we'll talk about this a little bit later, eBird and iNaturalist, uh, and also with uh, social media to share with one another, to learn from one another, to wonder with one another, even as we are physically separated from one another. Well, that was a great idea, but the question then arose, how are we going to do all of this? What are we going to um, do for sort of the, the subject matter? And although I didn't tell Phoebe at the time, I didn't really have any subject matter. I needed to go out and get some. I had to go find myself some birds and other wild things that I could talk about. Uh, if I had been with you all live in real life in person in Aspen, I think that we would have gone out together that morning and generated some photos and some sounds and some video and made a presentation of it and presented it that evening. Some of you all who were with me uh, in Aspen back in, I think it was July of 2019, probably remember that we did exactly that but I cannot physically be with you all uh, tonight. Uh, however, I still wanted to create a situation that was as similar to being in Aspen as possible. You may have gleaned from the uh, introductory image here that these birds are pine gross beaks, and you all have them in Aspen. I suspect they actually come right down into town during the winter months, and they're certainly um, around the, uh, the, the higher elevations just outside town throughout the year, and probably, um, as I said, right in town in the winter. We also see these where I live in Boulder County, not down in the lowlands where most people live, but way up high in the highlands. So I decided that I would go up into the highlands back on December 27th of this year and try to find some pine grosbeaks. 
but I actually had another goal in mind. Uh, one of my kids is 16 years old and is learning how to drive. And one of the recommended experiences for 16 year old drivers working from their permit to their driver's license is to get experience with adverse road conditions uh, in uh, challenging, I think they say difficult and challenging winter mountain terrain. Uh, you all have that up in Pitkin County and we certainly have that in Boulder County as well. So this is going to be the scene for this evening's presentation. We are right here just at about a 9,000 feet elevation. Uh, it's actually a little bit higher I believe than Aspen is and um, up in the highlands of Western Boulder County. Part of the reason for our being here is to get uh, experience in adverse road conditions, but part of our experience is to find birds and nature as well. There's gotta be an entire universe of memes devoted to uh, driving experiences with dad. But anyhow, here is where we got going. And after we got some of this adverse road uh, experience, we began to find birds like these pine grosbeaks. Pine grosbeaks are in fact all over the uh, highlands of Western Boulder County. This is a flock that my daughter and I spooked from the, uh, the ground where the birds were feeding. You can see that there are about, oh, I don't know, seven or eight in, uh, birds in this image and that they are not all the same. You see some sort of red ones and some yellow ones. And we got down to the business of trying to figure out who was who. Um, we see the image of the flock um, uh, departing from us right here, but we also got images of the birds uh, as they were sort of um, perched and a little bit more obliging, like, for example, this uh, beautiful adult male pine grosbeak. We know that this bird is an adult because it's got the uh, really extensive, deep, uh, rosaceous tones to it overall. And birds like this one, it's a female pine grosbeak, and this one has that sort of strange yellow-green uh, tint to it. Uh, these birds can actually look almost like um parrots with their sort of parrot-like bills and they, uh, in this case, yellowish, but sometimes very greenish plumage. Uh, and then we saw birds like this one. You might think that this is a, uh, a male and you'd be right, but it's probably not an adult male. You can see those orangish and sort of orangish green tints on the bird. So this is probably an immature male pine grosbeak. All right. Uh, mission accomplished, but not exactly. We made it up to the high country. We got some experience with a uh, winter driving and we sure saw a lot of pine grosbeaks. Back in the old days, by which I mean 2005, maybe 2000, even back into the 1990s, now we're really going back in time. Something like this probably would have been the end of our time together. We would have gone out, seen birds, perhaps taken pictures of them. Back in the day, we would have uh, developed the film and maybe uh, shown the slides around our, uh, our den <laughs> or at a, a bird club presentation, but gone no farther than that. In this day and age, though, everything has changed and the opportunity for sharing about these birds is something that uh, avails itself to almost everybody who's out there. So we're going to uh, combine these four pine grosbeak images here into this larger uh, collection of uh, images and also down there on the bottom right, uh, sounds of the pine grosbeak. Now, all of these are pine grosbeaks from December 27th of this year. You can see up there that there were 15 pine grosbeaks, and there's just a short note there indicating that plumage variation uh, was shown below. We're not going to do it right here, but we could click on each one of these images and get very specific uh, information about what exactly is going on in each image. I think many of you all, including folks who were just a moment here with me, uh, in Aspen a year and a half ago, will recognize that this is eBird output. So my daughter and I eBirded these pine grosbeaks, and this is just a little snippet of what we um, eBirded or uploaded to eBird. Again, these images, and in one case, these audio, uh, this audio recording of the pine grosbeaks. We'll look in a little bit more detail now exactly at what we did with our eBird checklist for that morning by going to the top of the checklist, literally, and uh, seeing sort of where we were, when we were, what we were doing, and so forth. This is the um, sort of entry uh, field for our eBird checklist here, and I've already entered or completed all the data. We did that as a, a group in ACES uh, a year and a half ago here, but uh, we have notes on where we were, when we were, how long we were there, exactly when we arrived, exactly when we left, and then you can see that at least the beginning of the checklist here, uh, Downey and Harry Woodpecker and some Stellar's Days, I have to look down a little bit lower here, uh, and then a, a complete record of the number of birds seen. We saw 12 species, 65 individuals. We supported five of those with photos, one with audio, and one with video. So this is the beginning of a um, 
documentation of our experience that uh, wintry uh, morning up there in the ward area of Western Boulder County. We're gonna scroll down a little bit here to the uh, sort of middle part of the checklist here. You can see the pine grow speaks down there again at the bottom. But I actually want to call your attention to a perhaps more um, pedestrian seeming bird, the uh, little chickadee up there. There were 10 of them actually, but um, one mountain chickadee in particular. When you're up in Ward and there just aren't a lot of birds other than, well, pine grosbeaks speaks and uh, Clark's nutcrackers, you wind up spending some quality time with fairly common birds like mountain chickadee. So we're gonna take a look at that image on the upper left here. And what I want us to do is go really into some detail here. So. This is the actual photo, um, at least as it came out of my camera, of the mountain chickadee. The mountain chickadee is a bird that even if you've never paid any attention to birds around, a, uh, around a Aspen, you certainly have encountered. It's one of the very characteristic birds uh, all over Pitkin County all year long, especially during the winter months. I think the mountain chickadee is the sort of bird that paradoxically we don't know all that well because it's so common that we just sort of uh, dismiss it and move on to something perhaps more exciting. But when I looked at the picture of this bird, I noticed something on a mountain, excuse me, on a mountain chickadee that I had never seen before, uh, namely the eye color. And unless you're looking at this on a phone, I think you can probably see that the eyes on that bird are a uh, sort of a auburn or chestnut color. And as I reviewed the photo, I thought to myself, I've had no idea that mountain chickadees can have auburn or uh, chestnut colored eyes. So I quickly pulled out my field guides and all of the uh, familiar illustrated field guides show mountain chickadees with coal black, jet black, pure black eyes. And then I went deeper into the scientific literature and found out that some mountain chickadees under some circumstances do in fact have these uh, more brownish sort of auburn or chestnut eyes, but with no information as to what the um, source of that variation is. Perhaps it's related to age. I think that's a possibility. Perhaps it's related to geographic variation. I doubt that's the case, but it would be very exciting if that were the case. Um, and it may just be something like human eye color. You know, some of us have green eyes and some of us have blue eyes and some of us have brown eyes. But the bottom line is that the reasons for which mountain chickadees have variable eye color is, as far as I can tell, unknown. All right, why am I telling you all of this? Well, here's the reason. It's because ordinary birders up in the high country learning how to drive in snowy conditions can go out with relatively inexpensive point and shoot cameras, that's the camera that I use and also the camera that my daughter uses, and obtain really close up documentation showing details of the eye color of birds. And we can contribute sightings like this to global databases like eBird and to others that I'll be describing in just a little while here and begin to uh, inform and uh, to inform science and perhaps to understand science better ourselves. So this chickadee with its brown eye, which I don't really understand, is out there for chickadee researchers all over the world to take a look at. So I've several times spoken about the global or universal aspect of sharing data in the digital age. And I wanna give you all a feel now for what exactly that looks like. So although it looks like we are just with a chickadee up here in the high country of Western Boulder County, I do wanna to continue to emphasize that we are in a great big global relational database with tens of millions of observations and hundreds of thousands of people contributing to it. And with all of these observations, including this one chickadee, one of 10 up there in Ward, we can begin to generate crowdsourced range maps like this one. So this is the eBird range map of all of the mountain chickadees that have ever been eBirded, that is to say contributed by observers like you and me to the eBird database. Uh, and as we can see, there is a fairly, um, uh, obvious concentration of mountain chickadee records in the far, uh, excuse me, in the Western half of North America. I can only see the, the top third of my screen here, but I'm sure that goes down to, yes, they're just down to about the US-Mexico uh, border there. And the areas with the, uh, the deep purple, uh, you see the areas of the highest concentration. In fact, you can see a nice big purple square there out in the uh, Front Range metro region of uh, Northeastern Colorado. Okay, so these are all of the mountain chickadees on Earth, but what is really, really amazing about eBird is that you can really uh, zoom in and see what's going on in your own neck of the woods. For example, we can look, and I'm gonna just move one thing here, excuse me, there we go, um, at the chickadees of uh, Aspen, Colorado, and we can zoom in like this, and whoops, how about zoom in like this? 
Okay, sorry about that. How about zooming in like this? There we go. Okay, and we have now a um, an aerial map of our fair city. This is Aspen right here, and you see all these stick pins. Some are blue, and some are that sort of orangish red, uh, denoting uh, eBird records by ordinary rank and file eBirders like you and me. The blue stick pins indicate records that are more than 30 days old. Uh, the orange stick pins indicate sites from which there have been mountain chickadee sightings in the past 30 days. And the um, great big orange stick pin with that little white flame-like thing in it uh, indicates the place with the most mountain chickadee sightings of all during the past 30 days. So we are going to zoom in and see what that's all about. And it turns out that we are hot at the Aspen Center for Environmental Studies. So you all are a hot spot for a mountain chickadee documentation in the uh, um, in the um, at Pitkin County uh, area of, uh, of Western Colorado. Um, I'm not gonna go into too much more detail here, but I also wanna point out that you can, you can in fact uh, delve even deeper. Uh, you can go back to, for example, uh, December 1st of 2020 of this year and see that Rebecca Weiss found one mountain chickadee at the Aspen Center for Environmental Studies. I'm not gonna go any farther into um, uh, the, the business here, but that little flag there indicates that Rebecca Weiss uh, in, in indicated some notes on the chickadee. I happen to recall that there were some notes on the bird's uh, vocalizations. Uh, Rebecca also noted that there was, for example, a, a wood duck uh, on that date, which I assume is getting fairly late for um, the Aspen area, maybe one or two uh, winter wood ducks, but that must be a fairly unusual bird there. So this is a, um, a demonstration, I've gone here fairly quickly here, of um, the way that the eBird database sort of um, dances between sort of interplays, plays off of um, the very personal and also the very global. We've gone from a, a particular mountain chickadee that I saw in Ward, Colorado back on December 27th to the entire global database of all mountain chickadees ever eBirded by all people who eBird and then all the way back down to this very refined level of a particular mountain chickadee seen on December 21st, uh, sorry, December 1st of 2020 by a particular observer at a particular location in a particular place in Colorado. All right, lots and lots of things that we are doing with birds. And I want to just briefly take the opportunity to say that this activity has really generated um, or uh, aroused the interest of folks doing really important big science with policy implications. It seems like almost every day and probably at least every other week or so, some major new recommendation or even uh, implementation of conservation strategy comes out in the peer-reviewed technical literature based on eBird data compiled by people like you and me. We're not usually involved in the actual analysis of the data and even rarely, uh, even more rarely in the policy uh, making and the policy implementation. But the nuts and bolts of people like Catherine Hagen and Ann Larson and Rebecca Weiss and others, uh, the, the actual on the ground, boots on the ground, people with binoculars and checklists recording birds, they go along here, is uh, really importantly influencing the way that we do conservation science. When I say we, I mean the people who implement conservation science in the a 21st century. The question arises all the time, you know, is it important? You know, are my bird sightings worth anything? And the answer is absolutely. I understand that that one mountain chickadee on December 1st, 2020 is only one mountain chickadee, but all of those thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of records of mountain chickadees in the aggregate very importantly inform what we are all about as a conservation community. Alrighty, we're going to shift gears at this point. And by the way, just a note out there to Phoebe and Jim, um, if there are comments, I'm not able to see them because of a local um, um, setting that I have going on here. So uh, you'll have to just pop in and interrupt, which is absolutely fine if um, something requires clarification at any point. And yeah, I do want to move now from uh, birds because there's more to natural history than birds um, and take a look at some of the other taxa that are out there. So along with mountain chickadees and pine grow speaks, we saw up in Ward on December 27th, I almost said birds, no, uh, organisms like this one. Uh, this is not my photo. My daughter, Hannah Floyd, uh, took this image. I never know what to call these uh, rock squirrels, pine squirrels, red squirrels, chicories. They have all sorts of different names here. But uh, this fellow was out there along with the uh, Clark's nutcrackers and the mountain chickadees and the uh, pine grosbeaks. 
And whereas I am sort of particularly inclined toward getting all of my records onto eBird, my daughter goes in a different direction and puts many of her records onto iNaturalist. So this is that red squirrel, a uh, pine squirrel, what, I apologize, whatever the official name is, I'm not sure it appears to be Tamia Sciorus Hudsonicus, and perhaps that's the name that we should use for it. So um, there's that great big blue stick pin over there. If you're following along, I'm hovering over it right here. So we're still in ward. In fact, uh, this image is uh, literally just feet away from some of the birds that we have seen here. And although I'm not gonna click in on all of them, we have six different images of the same pine squirrel, rock squirrel, again, a Tamia Sciurus Hudsonicus here uh, in Ward. So iNaturalist, which is where we are right now, is um, at its deepest level of conception, sort of the same thing as eBird. It is a crowdsourced record of all of the things that are out there. eBird is, of course, limited to birds. Uh, iNaturalist uh, is uh, expands to include anything that is alive. In fact, things that are dead as well, fossils and uh, um, specimens preserved in amber, um, even what we call signs. So for example, nests or footprints or uh, woodpecker diggings uh, can be part of the iNaturalist database as well. And also of, I think, um, very uh, sort of fundamental significance in terms of data analysis, the um, the unit of um, the sort of basic unit of, um, of data in eBird and iNaturalist is, is totally different. So eBird is based entirely on checklists. You go out and you note or record everything that you saw. And then that checklist of everything, including from pine grosbeaks speaks to evening grosbeaks speaks to downy woodpeckers to hairy woodpeckers, that becomes the unit of analysis. But um, iNaturalist has as its unit of analysis the individual itself. So the squirrel, as opposed to a checklist with squirrels and other mammals perhaps, uh, is in fact the fundamental unit of analysis. Like eBird, uh, these very detailed range maps uh, can be produced and they are being uh, mined by data experts all over the world to try to understand uh, the status and distribution of squirrels and other animals. You can see here the uh, record of birds, oh, sorry, birds. <laughs> there goes that bird bias again of these mammals uh, from Western Boulder County there. Not too surprisingly, there's a collection of stick pins in the foothills near Boulder where so many people uh, go birding and then uh, fewer of them up in the um, foothills to the West, just reflecting in general uh, less uh, naturalist activity up there. Okay, we are going to continue now in our iNaturalist database, and we're still in Hannah Floyd's database here. And I just want to use this as an illustration again of the um, the unit of analysis that is, that is the individual itself. So you see here um, some of the various um, organisms that Hannah and I saw that day afield. Um, and there's that number three in front of the wild turkey. So that means that she has three photos of that particular wild turkey. You see the six associated with the, pine, the American red squirrel, the two with the pine grosbeak. And this is a really, really nice feature of, um, of iNaturalist that we can have multiple uh, documentations of the same individual. And it can be a very valuable way of understanding variation uh, in that uh, individual. You know, a photo is wonderful, but to have five or six, or at least in the case of this, yeah, six in the case of the squirrel, three in the case of the turkey, uh, different forms of documentation of the same individual is so valuable. I should point out, by the way, that the snake and the sparrow and the goose were not up in ward. Um, the snakes in ward are sleeping at this time of the year. Um, that snake, by the way, is a legit, uh, I think Christmas day or maybe the day after Christmas sighting of a, a garter snake that had come out on uh, just a warm, sunny afternoon right after uh, Christmas, and then the sparrow and the goose are birds that we saw closer to home uh, down in the Boulder County lowlands. Alrighty, I'm going to um, go on to another gear shift uh, right now. And again, let me just pop up here real quickly. And I can't tell if there are chats, but again, uh, Phoebe or Jim, feel free to pop in if anybody uh, requires um, instant um, clarification on anything here. We've looked at eBird, we've looked at iNaturalist, these are both fundamentally scientific databases. They are crowdsourced by people with um, greatly varying levels of expertise, but because they are uh, such large databases, they are uh, robust to errors, um, uh, both of just sort of basic data entry as well as um, misidentification errors. And with so much data coming in, there are very good ways of smoothing out the mistakes that are invariably made. But eBird and iNaturalist are fundamentally scientific. Yes, they're fun. I greatly enjoy doing both activities, but they're not, strictly speaking, what I would consider to be social media. 
Speaking of social media, we're going to shift gears, as I said, and consider the social media aspect to sharing at the present time. So um, we're still in my daughter's um, digital universe right now. This is her iNaturalist account here. You can see that squirrel over there. And in the middle, that looks like a redneck grebe. And then a long-billed dowager over there on the right. And this is just the, just the top of her um, uh, Instagram page right here. And what she's done, and I'm really sort of uh, impressed, I have to say, by the discipline here, is um, to kind of uh, really specify or designate her iNaturalist account for uh, sharing uh, cool sightings of things that she sees around Colorado and, well, this year only in Colorado in the past, uh, elsewhere. Um, and then also uh, learning from other people. And this uh, Hannah Floyd underscore naturalist account has become a, a really great resource for me to uh, sort of figure out what people are seeing out there, uh, tips that they use for um, sometimes sharing uh, identification and biology information, but also, and this is totally fine and totally healthy and totally appropriate, uh, oohs and ahs, and where can I find one of those myself? And did you really see that? And, and comments like that. So I know that there's been um, a lot of um, a proper and, and appropriate, well-deserved skepticism of late of social media, and I'm not going to um, rebut any of that. Uh, but I also want to say that it's a tool and that sites like this, uh, Hannah Floyd underscore naturalist site, uh, can be really um, informative and I think even uh, inspiring. Hannah wrote an article just, um, I guess, a few weeks ago in Birding Magazine that's published by uh, my employer, the American Birding Association, on the sort of uh, yin and yang, the healthy tension between the uh, scientific impulses of iNaturalists over, over here and the more sort of sharing and social media impulses of uh, Instagram. These are not the sightings, by the way, from uh, Aspen or a boulder in the dead of winter. This is a, a, a bared sandpiper over here on the lower left from, um, I believe, August in southeastern Colorado and a, a rare Hayhurst scallop wing here down in the lower right. And that's a... Um, a wild geranium up there in the upper right. And this article, which um, is on the ABA website, um, go to aba.org, don't do it right now, but do it after the presentation, uh, is available to the public. It's, uh, it's free for download by anybody who wants to uh, download the PDF or uh, to just be read online in the flipbook format right there. So um, iNaturalist and Instagram, just to use two examples here, are not interchangeable. One of them, the former, is a decidedly and sort of purposefully scientific undertaking. Uh, and the latter is really for sharing and learning and discovering together. But um, taken in concert, I think that resources like this can be marvelous resources, uh, not only for sharing with one another, but really learning a lot as you go along. Um, I confess that I have not yet drunk the Kool-Aid of um, Instagram, and I perhaps never shall, but um, uh, I have not actually yet been banned from Twitter. Uh, and here it's a uh, snippet from my, uh, from my Twitter page um, of those very self-same pine grow speaks that we use to start off our presentation and that actually are going to sort of signal the um, end of um, the remarks that I have for you all this evening. Um, Again, this is pure, unadulterated, unabashed, and I want to say a very uh, unapologetic, uh, just sharing in wonder about the Pine Grove Speaks of Boulder County, and I assure you they are out there in uh, Pitkin County as well. Okay, so as we start to um, wind down, I want to get a glass of water, I suppose, but also... Um, Send you all off this evening before we start the uh, question and answer session here with some um, commendations, some uh, exhortations from where to go with all of this. So I have made the case, I hope, or at least um, stated my um, opinion or my preference, that there is much to do with uh, digital natural history. We can do it scientifically with iNaturalist and eBird. We can do it sort of through social media with Twitter and with Instagram. And that's all well and good. And I do feel that some very powerful sharing and learning has come out of all of that. But there is absolutely no substitute for being out there in real life with real organisms. And as I'm sure you have been able to glean already, everything, every single image that I've shown you before uh, so far uh, has been based on a real life experience with real life organisms out there in the wild. So Go outside, <laughs> look at birds, look at a hay here scallop wings when the uh, weather's a bit milder, look at bared sandpipers and everything else that we've looked at today. Go find rock squirrels. I suspect you might be able to find something about rock squirrels as familiar as they are that nobody else has ever uh, figured out. And here's my, uh, here's my charge to you. Um, it has to do actually with New Year's resolutions. So 
if I'm doing my math right here, we are almost at the end of the first week of the new year. I remember reading a couple of years ago that 50% of all New Year's resolutions fail by the end of the first week of the new year. And um, I have to say that after that scrumptious Three Kings Day cake yesterday on the sixth day of the new year, uh, one of my most important New Year's resolutions fell by the wayside. So our New Year's resolutions are um, by and large um, falling fast into the rearview mirror here. But here's a thought for you all. So tomorrow, you know, they always say tomorrow is the beginning of the next day of your life. Well, tomorrow is the beginning of the second week of the new year. So let's forget about all of the uh, indulgences and excesses of the uh, first week of the new year. And um, I have a resolution that I would propose to each one of you all that you could actually start tomorrow on the first day of the second week of the new year. You still have 51 weeks to go. And uh, why not get underway here without all the uh, pressure and tension of having to uh, start on January 1st? And here it goes. I want to encourage each one of you all, and this can be done by anybody, young or old, um, folks who uh, can't get outside very often, uh, folks who um, can't get out to wild places very often. I want to encourage everybody to pay attention to real birds and other organisms in the natural world for at least um, a few minutes every single day for the rest of the year. So if I'm doing the math right, we have uh, 358 days still to go. So my challenge for you is to go outside and make note of natural things for the next 358 days. If you want to take this challenge to an even greater level, I'm going to propose that you also contribute your sightings to eBird, to iNaturalist, to uh, Instagram, to Twitter, to Facebook, elsewhere. Um, I, there are some other resources I haven't talked about at all, like the marvelous uh, crowdsource um, uh, database, uh, Zeno Canto, that's, uh, that comes out of Holland. Lots of other ways to do this and to do it for the next 358 days. So both eBird and iNaturalist make this really, really easy for you. They report consecutive day streaks. So if you've been uh, iNatting for 14 days in a row, they'll tell you that. Or if you've been eBirding for 150 days in a row, they'll tell you that. And I want to share with you all a screen capture um, from somebody uh, who's gotten just a little bit carried away with things. Down there on the lower left, you can see that days of checklist streak. Um, and this person has been eBirding for 5,119 consecutive days, which is, I think, a bit more than 14 years. I'm asking you to only do it for 358 days. Um, so that person, as you may have surmised, is actually yours truly. And I want to say that um, the past 5,119 days, and actually we're up to 5,120 now, um, have been in some ways the the greatest 5,120 days of my life. Uh, there have been lots of stresses in life, both personal and um, of the sort that affect all of us. But the discipline of going outside every single day for 5,119 days in a row, looking for something, in this case birds, and sharing it with all the world has been uh, transforming for me. I don't know that it's been life-saving, but it has tremendously enhanced and improved my quality of life. And I see no reason to imagine that this streak will stop until the day I die. So if you all invite me uh, 10 or 20 years from now, I hope that this uh, streak, it'll actually will take more than 10 years, but uh, maybe 13 or 14 years from now, uh, we'll be up into the five digits and we can revisit what the past 12 or 13 years have been like. So go outside, watch birds, watch other organisms, See if you can do it every single day of the year. It's good for the rest of the world. And I think most of all, it's good for you. On a final note here, I do want to say that I look forward to getting back to Aspen with all of you. Here are some images that I think some of you all will recall from July of 2019. And I can't again see the entire screen here, but it looks like we've got a green-tailed towhee there in the upper left. And that's one of the uh, checker spots. I think the Arachne checker spot on the lower left. And that's a Mariposa lily on the upper right a Wyoming ground squirrel on the center right. And I can't see, oh, a magpie, of course, a black-billed magpie there, down there on the lower um, right. I know that I was with uh, Phoebe and uh, Rebecca and some of the rest of you all uh, for these sightings. And 
images like this are um, are bittersweet for me and they're bittersweet for me right now not so much because they happen in the middle of the summer i actually really love winter to be honest with you and i suspect that anybody who lives in aspen either loves winter or probably shouldn't be living in aspen um what i'm bittersweet about is that i know that all five of these images uh, were taken in the immediate presence of other people now I love my family, don't get me wrong here, but I'm also kind of looking forward to the time that you and I and many others can uh, gather together as uh, big groups of people and uh, sort of gawk uh, and wonder together at Toei's and checker spots and mariposa lilies and Wyoming ground squirrels, black-billed magpies, and apparently eight other organisms. So I'm not sure when that time will come. Um, if it's this summer, that's wonderful. If we have to wait another year or so, uh, so be it. But uh, getting back together, studying nature together, wondering together, sharing together, and then transmitting that knowledge and that wonder and that sharing as widely as we can is certainly what I'm all about. I think it's, in fact, I know it's what the American Birding Association about is all about. And I can certainly uh, attest from my own experiences with you all in person, that is what you all are all about as well. So we've got a ways to go. This pandemic, unfortunately, is not going anywhere, at least for the rest of this winter and realistically uh, into the spring and perhaps beyond. Um, but don't despair. As you know, you're already charged starting tomorrow morning to look for birds and other wildlife for the next 358 consecutive days. And I hope that holds you all over in good stead until we're able to uh, get back together and do all of this in person. I assure you that getting back to Pitkin County, getting back to Aspen is at the top of my to-do list, and I look forward to doing that with you all in real life. Uh, we can't do that tonight, but we certainly can spend a little bit of time chatting together. And I think at this point, Phoebe, if you're still with us, I will um, turn the proceedings back over to you. I think what I need to do is to discontinue the screen share here, which I'm about to do. And um, if there are questions, I do see some in stuff going on in the chat here. Um, Phoebe, do I take questions direct from you or do I go to the chat? Sure, I will. Um, I'll read off some of these. We do have a number of questions. Thank oh, you so much, Ted, for such an amazing talk. And oh, thank you. you um, get out and do your challenge. <laughs> uh, and um, we'll try to get through some of these questions. Feel free to keep adding to our questions. Um, first question that I'm going to ask is, um, what type of conservation policies have arisen from these digital recording sites? Great. Hey, before I answer that question, Phoebe, um, and I'm kind of putting you and others on the spot here, um, if it's okay with the person, I would love to know who asked the question and where they're from. I don't need any other detail, but if it's a uh, Phoebe from uh, Aspen or Ted from, from Boulder, it, I might even know the person, but um, knowing that the question's coming from, say, Aspen as opposed to Boston um, is useful to me. So if that's, is that possible or? I just have the names right here. Okay, well, let's, we'll start with names Dale then. Okay. Taylor asked that I'm question. sorry? Dale Taylor asked that question. Okay. And so, I, and I'm sorry, I kind of forgot the question, but I think the question was what sorts of actual policies have, have come out of this, right? So um, I'd say that eBird is um, sufficiently young now that it's more or less, um, I shouldn't say more or less, uh, largely a pure science, basic science that's coming out of uh, eBird right now. So for example, understanding uh, precisely uh, how fast birds migrate north in spring. So we have this very general idea that birds like uh, wood thrushes, for example, are in Mexico in until the late winter and then they show up in, let's say, Boston uh, in May. But the actual speed with which they move north is something that we've never really been able to, to document at all. And we have that information now because eBird can give us daily, practically hourly sort of a speeds of migration. And we can um, play this off against um, sort of weather patterns and understand just how uh, damaging, how dangerous weather can be to migrating birds. And what we're also doing as we go back into the uh, older database is learning how the speed of migration is actually increasing because birds are under pressure to get as far north as possible because um, uh, bud break, which is to say when the, um, the, 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 uh, the leaves, the trees um, begin to uh, form their leaves and the insects follow and, and um, as a result of that is happening earlier and earlier. So birds are racing to get north faster and faster and eBird is helping us to understand that. So that's one example from the Eastern United States. Thank you, Ted. Um, this is from Emily Taylor. Did community science apps like iNaturalist see an increase in users in 2020? Yeah, so um, this is the awesome. very short answer to my question is I don't know, but everything I've heard suggests that that is in fact 
the case. Um, that's a somewhat anecdotal response, I realize, but uh, so many uh, folks are paying attention to birds and nature for the first time. And I haven't seen um, actual, you know, technical reports to indicate that there's been a, you know, a 22% increase in iNaturalist use, you know, 18% of which is attributable to the pandemic. But everything I've been hearing anecdotally is that uh, interest in app-based and crowdsource-based learning is increasing drastically uh, in the past nine or 10 months. Wonderful, this is from Ed. And can you describe the point and click camera you used for those photos? To make yeah, sure. So. Um, this is not necessarily an endorsement, although I have to say I'm very satisfied with the, the instrument that I, that I use. It's called the uh, Canon SX70. Uh, so Canon's the maker, and then there's an SX series. Uh, that's a letter S and the letter X, so Canon SX70. Uh, it's a point and shoot camera. It doesn't involve detachable lenses or anything uh, like that. It um, has both macro capability for insects and then a telephoto capability for, for birds. So um, in that last um, series of images that I showed from Aspen from last summer, you know, we had that rather distant green-tailed towhee, uh, which I took with a telephoto, um, well, I shouldn't say lens, it's the exact same lens, but the telephoto um, uh, function and then the checker spot below with the macro function. I will say that it's not free, but it's an awful lot less expensive than um, the binoculars and telescopes that I think many of us are accustomed to using. Um, sort of a dirty little secret is that I don't really use a telescope much anymore because the macro, excuse me, the telephoto capability on that camera is so good. And um, I sometimes don't even go outside with binoculars anymore, but I never leave home without the camera. Um, the Canon SX70, brand new from Canon is probably $600. Um, so it's not, as I said, free, but it's a lot less than a high-end binocular or a high-end telescope. And I can't imagine myself any now, any, any longer not being without uh, such an instrument. It's the same one that my daughter uses and she uses it with more facility uh, than, than I do. Uh, there are other um, very um, popular cameras out there by Leica uh, and by Nikon as well but um, the one I'm using is the Canon SX70. Wonderful, I'm combining a few questions that yep. um, relate to similar themes, but um, there have been a few questions about if you can post these services a few days later, um, if you don't have access to internet that very day, and then if photos are really important as well, or just simply the notations of the sighting. Yeah, um, I got. I totally understood the second part of the question. Can you say the first part again about something about a couple of days later? Yeah, if you can post your sightings. A few oh, oh, sure, 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 a absolutely. Sorry, I thought you meant could you host programs like this one a few days later? I thought, well, that's up to you, Phoebe. I don't know, but but um, y yes, there's no uh, statute of limitations, if you will, on when you can um, or when you would uh, upload your sightings. I try to do it the day of because everything sort of fresh in my mind uh, at the time. But let's say that you were away from a laptop, heaven forbid, might be a nice thing, or away from a phone or something like that. And you just had a good old fashioned notebook and, uh, and uh, you know, pen and pencil, uh, pen and paper with you. Yes, you can absolutely upload uh, your notes um, days, months, or years, or even decades later. So uh, the answer is yes, although I find that um, in terms of the immediacy and just the, the memory and the recall, I try to do it as fast as possible. Um, actually, I, although you didn't ask this question, I, I feel obliged to um, touch on this because I probably should have done it during the presentation. I've um, sort of made the case for a laptop-based, uh, you know, sort of camera to computer uh, synchronizing of, of all of my records. All of this can be done in real time in the field as well. So while you are in the field, you can uh, upload a photo to iNaturalist or you can upload sightings to eBird as you go along. So that's the ultimate in immediacy. And I don't have the statistic in front of me, but I wanna say that um, many eBirders and most iNaturalist users are in fact uh, inputting the data as they go along. Um, some uh, stall, uh, sorry, some uh, older guard uh, users like myself are doing it sort of the, the evening of, uh, and then you can, in fact, do it much later if you prefer to. And by the way, Phoebe, while you go, I have to say it's daunting to note that even as we're um, answering these questions, the number of questions seems to be increasing. So, uh, how about that? <laughs> 
This is great. Um, this question is from Andre Willie, and it is, was Ebert able to determine any explanations for the mass appearance and die off of the Wilson's warblers and other migratory birds that happened occurred this spring? Yeah, so, um, wait, it's spring or fall? Uh, sorry. So yeah, so so um, let me just back up and paint the, the picture there. So um, Phoebe, you did say fall, right? I think it's meant to be fall, yes. Oh yeah, fall, right, right. So back on um, September 8th of this year, uh, especially in the eastern part of, no, actually you all had in the western part as well, we had that uh, astonishing early snowstorm. Uh, we had quite a bit, of, about six inches of snow in Boulder on September 8th. Uh, and it was a very um, unusual system with an extreme northerly component to it and it actually intensified as it pushed down into New Mexico. And uh, anecdotally, um, enormous numbers of, of dead birds were being picked up by people, most of all sort of sort of from like Albuquerque um, south into uh, south central New Mexico. And the question arose like, why were all of these birds dying? And all sorts of possibilities arose. That was of course a time during uh, those terrible fires that so many of us experienced in the fall. Um, there were some exotic explanations about military testing. Um, there was another one that I can't quite bring to mind now, but it had to do with environmental toxins. But um, using the massive uh, eBird database, but then also importantly, picking up dead birds and actually performing autopsies on them uh, led to the um, almost certain conclusion that those die-offs were due entirely to the weather. So what happens is that birds that are ordinarily, you know, a month and a half away from, um, you know, being in Mexico, so, you know, southern, uh, what, southwestern Mexico, uh, where it's basically warm throughout the winter, were caught in sub-freezing temperatures, especially in New Mexico, but also in Colorado for uh, at least 36 hours. So the farther south you got, uh, the more intensive the die-offs were. Here in Colorado, the, uh, the worst die-offs were in um, around uh, Trinidad and uh, Walsenburg in um, the um, south central part of the state, and then it really intensified in New Mexico. So the, um, the smoking gun, if you will, was not eBird data. It was actual autopsies of dead birds performed by scientists at the uh, University of New Mexico. But the magnitude of the phenomenon was absolutely documented by eBird. Um, there's a few questions about kind of what birds to record to eBird. So there's a question that um, from Kim Levin, uh, in terms of birds, seen at a regular home feeder, would you report the eBird or only ones seen in the wild? Wondering about the repeat customers being over-reported. And then there's also one about just reporting novel birds versus the common. Right, okay, great. Thanks so much for bringing that up. That's a really, it's a critical point. And I wanna say as uh, emphatically and as unambiguously as possible that eBird absolutely positively wants you to report everything. There's a very well-known bias in the eBird database toward rare birds. So um, somebody goes out to Pitkin County because they just really want to see pine grosbeaks and rosy finches, and they neglect to uh, note the mountain chickadees around town. And that's actually a, a big mistake because it biases the database toward rarity and gives the impression that rare birds are relatively better distributed in the environment than they really are. So again, as, um, un, as, sorry, as emphatically and as unambiguously as possible, please do report everything. When you're done entering an eBird checklist, you get this sort of nag at the bottom that says, are you reporting every bird that you saw to the best of your ability? And um, if you enter no, you can still enter your record and it will go in your personal checklist, but it actually is um, tossed out for data analysis purposes because eBird absolutely has to know where the mountain chickadees and the European starlings and uh, the Stellar's jays are, as well as the um, perhaps more desired birds out there. Um, I think the first question was about birds at a feeder and um, don't worry about those repeat customers. Uh, eBird really, really wants to know that the same, you know, marauding band of four mountain chickadees is showing up day after day after day. So uh, thanks for that question. And the answer is yes, uh, include sightings of everything. Wonderful. Um, have time for a few more questions. Sure. Um, this is from Karen Teague. Um, she loved your book, How to oh, Know. Thank uh, you birds uh, and how can a passionate non-expert birder contribute most significantly to the conservation of our beloved feathered friends? Yeah, you know, um, I'm going to go in two directions with that. So my personal inclination as a 
lifelong bird watcher and an almost lifelong scientist is to say that contributing to these crowdsourced databases is very, very, very important. The things that the big data scientists and other gurus are doing with our data uh, is a very uh, encouraging to me. So being an eBirder, being on iNaturalist, and by the way, perhaps doing it old school, <laughs> there actually still are, believe it or not, published <laughs> treatises on the status and distribution of birds of um, states. Actually, Rebecca Weiss did a marvelous book on the birds of the Roaring Fork Valley and the Aspen area. You know, I'll consider that to be sort of an old school contribution. Those are very, very important. But I would say that even more important than being an eBirder and being an iNaturalist um, are two other things. Um, one of them is politics. It's being political. And I don't necessarily mean storming the barricades or whatever happened yesterday, but I mean um, being aware of the conservation and environmental consequences of a lot of uh, policy decisions, uh, some of which seem to be only nominally about conservation and habitat. So um, anything to do with energy, uh, anything to do with population, um, and actually a lot of the issues having to do with social justice are much more impactful where the environment is concerned. And I think a lot, now you all at ACES probably recognize that, but um, I think a lot of folks um, have a sort of narrow or limited conception of what environmental politics is. And there are few things in politics that really do not uh, impinge on the environment. And although politics and voting are important things, um, the biggest of all to me really is education. And I realize that's what ACES is all about. And that's also what the American Birding Association is all about. Um, getting folks out into nature, or onto the internet, if that's how we're gonna be doing during the pandemic is probably the most important thing uh, that you can do. Seeing how organisms and communities interact with one another, how they interact with us, how we uh, depend on organisms in the community and also how our lives are valuably uh, affected by and I think uh, inspired by them is probably the most important thing we can do. So go out, watch birds, contribute your sightings, vote, and educate people. And, and, oh, and by the way, and be receptive to um, the educational offerings of other people as well. I don't mean to imply that every one of us is God's gift to education. Uh, every one of us also should be receptive to and responsive to the um, uh, education that we can receive from other people as well. Um, this one is from Jim Edelton, and it's, uh, what do you think of birds of the world.org site? How are you using it? And if you use Merlin. Okay. Um, I heard birds of the world and I took a sip of water and then I heard Merlin. What was the second? Actually, let's, well, let's do those two and then you can. Okay. How you so, use them and what you think of, or if oh, you. Okay. So um, birds of the world, which launched recently is a Cornell laboratory of ornithology, Macaulay library offering that is sort of a, um, like an encyclopedia of, of all the birds on earth, all 11,000 species of them because it's online, it's online only, there's no print version of birds of the world. It tends to emphasize videos, uh, audio, uh, beautiful photos, interactive range maps uh, and the like. I don't remember when it launched, but I mean, re recently in the past, you know, year, I want to say somebody I think is going to, you know, accuse me of that. I can't believe you didn't know it was 14 months ago, but anyhow, it was fairly recent. And I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that I consult birds of the world every single day. It's an invaluable professional resource um, to me. For those of you all who haven't heard it about it, it's um, it's sort of version two of the, uh, the, the classic old birds of North America. And birds of North America just became birds of the world. So they went from, you know, the seven or 800 species in the North America, north of Mexico, to uh, all the birds in the world. Um, Second part of the question was about Merlin. So Merlin is a bird identification app that I personally don't use. Uh, that's not a, a diss on Merlin, but it's intended for um, entry level uh, bird watchers and, and nature identifiers in general. So um, I've heard nothing but, well, I shouldn't say I don't use it. I, I played around with it, but I've never applied it to my own um, experiences in the field. But uh, the way Merlin works is that you either upload images or you answer a few questions. And then based on uh, where you are, when you are, what the bird looks like, what color it is, and then ideally a photo, uh, you very quickly uh, have the bird identified for you. So I've heard wonderful things about Merlin. Um, now Merlin's for birds. I do want to say that an app I use all the time is iNaturalist and the app is called the iNaturalist Seek app. And although I can identify pretty much all the birds I see, I sure can't identify all of the um, beetles and even fewer of the lichens. And it is just marvelous to me how you can upload an image to iNaturalist and it tells you what beetle or lichen you are looking at. Uh, 
All right, I think this will be our last question. Um, okay. It comes with a fun story. Uh, it's um, a question from Craig Ward. And um, he was up at a hut trip um, up at around 11,000 feet through about three years ago and they saw very large pine grosbeaks, beaks and their coloring was bold with bright red and black and white coloring. Um, they were bigger than a large blue jay or magpie. They were very excited that they had found a new subspecies and came back down. And because the birds were larger than the ones that they normally see. Uh, so how would one try to identify a bird when it doesn't fit into the description from a bird book or Google searches? Do you have any? Wow. Well, I'll get a photo. And I know that's sort of a, um, a sort of snarky thing uh, to say, but um, even a cell phone photo uh, can be remarkably uh, informative. And I think most of us now do go afield uh, with cell phones. Uh, there's also no, um, no real substitute for just good natural history note taking. Um, if the bird was doing something significant, eating a food stuff that you're not familiar with or flocking in a particular way or giving a strange sound as it flew off, that sort of information, even though it might not be recorded in the photo can be very valuable as well. Um, Talk to other people. Uh, typically, folks in uh, museums, universities, bird clubs uh, will be um, interested in um, hearing what you uh, have to say and perhaps uh, providing some uh, insight into uh, what you actually saw out there. I would say that the uh, the more copious your notes, your better. And again, if you have a, a cell phone with you, which you probably do, getting an image would be wonderful. I also want to just briefly say, uh, in the case particular of a, a vocal bird like the pine grosbeak that um, should also remember that your cell phone, in addition to being a, a fairly good camera, is an excellent uh, audio recorder as well. And if you just push the voice memos or um, oh, what's there, there's some just really common apps there that just come free with um, most of your, your cell phones. Uh, and just make sure you point the microphone at the bird, not at yourself. Uh, you can get very high quality and diagnostic audio as well. So consider that um, if the bird is making sounds as well. So take a picture if you can, uh, get audio if you can, take lots of notes and um, find an expert as soon as you can. Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much for joining us this evening. Please tune in again on Thursday the 21st. Um, and look for pre-registration links and for those talks as well. Thank you so much for joining and thank you so much, Ted, for uh, taking time to share uh, this incredible information with yep. us. Thanks everybody for having me. And I do want to say that um, if, if anybody wants to be in touch, probably the best thing to do is to uh, go to aba.org. I'm sort of all over that website and there are, also, there are uh, sort of who's who and staff directories there and you can easily find me and uh, track me down uh, that way. Also, I think Phoebe probably knows where um, I, I am if you absolutely have to get through me uh, that way as well. So I um, just really want to say to Phoebe and to all of you, all, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here, or be here, there, wherever we are uh, tonight. And um, if there is more follow up, um, probably easiest of all just to find me through aba.org um, and we can take it from there.